And I'm going to talk to you about this scenario on screen in particular. Um, this scenario actually is one of the most uh, fear-inducing things for many people all over the world every single day. As you're working unsuspectingly in your job, there's a slithering, dangerous snake nearby. And this is a reality for millions of people all over the world. They're at risk of a snake bite. And the consequences of those bites can be life-changing. Now, snakes, despite this threat, have actually, actually been fascinating creatures that have influenced humans, and civilizations, and cultures for thousands of years. Whether it being adorned on the crowns of ancient Egyptian rulers or playing key roles in religious texts like the story of Adam and Eve. And even today, snakes have incredible symbolism in our world. They are found on the logos of many of the world's health organizations, for example. So where does this fascination with these creatures stem from? Well, snakes are obviously unusual animals. When we think of them in the context of vertebrates like ourselves, the first thing we notice about them is that they don't have arms or legs. And actually, they've lost those limbs over millions of years of evolutionary time as they separated from their lizard relatives. But snakes have a whole array of fascinating adaptations that have enabled them to become really successful predators all over the world, from the rainforests of the tropics to hot, dry, arid desert regions, and even colonizing the world's oceans. One of the fascinating things about snakes is that many of them are able to eat really large prey items relatively infrequently. So some snakes might only feed once or twice a year on animals that are weighing more than the snake themselves or that are actually larger than the snake's mouth. And that begs the question, how can snakes overpower such large prey without using arms or legs or claws or talons? Well, they've come up with two main solutions. They use their mouths to bite, but then they can also use either constriction, which is the ability of the snake to, to wrap a strong body coil around its prey to subdue it, or they use a chemical weapon that we call venom. And this venom consists of lots of toxic molecules that are injected into a prey using fangs when they bite them. And this causes rapid immobilization so the snake can feed on these prey at their leisure. Now, one of the uh, really interesting things about these snakes is that they are really potent fear provokers. So what do you see when you see this image of a snake coiled up, ready to strike defensively if provoked? For many people, just looking at an image like this stimulates a response. Their hands get a bit sweaty. They start to panic. And snakes are actually one of the most potent fear inducers in people. So perhaps as many as a third of people identify as being ophidiophobic. That is, they are afraid of snakes. And even if you don't outwardly fear this snake on screen behind me, research has told us that when people are shown images of snakes alongside other dangerous and non-dangerous animals, it's snakes that are the most potent activators of fear-sensing neurons in our brains. So unconsciously, these animals stimulate a really potent response in us, even if outwardly we're not aware of it. And this begs a really fundamental question, because this happens no matter whether people are actually in a place where snakes are dangerous to people or not. So why do we have this ability to fear snakes so extremely? It's likely the result of co-evolutionary interactions that have occurred over millions of years in evolutionary time, specifically between our ancestors, early primates and snakes. Now, early primates were, were predominantly uh, prey for some of these snakes. And even today, certain snake species will still eat monkeys and lemurs, for example. And while we, humans are generally considered to be too large to be a meal for these animals, there are still a few exceptions to this rule. But ultimately, those interactions that have occurred over millions of years, 
may even have influenced the way that we see the world today. The snake detection hypothesis proposes that the uh, predatory pressure that snakes put upon people may well have stimulated our visual acuity. That is the way that we're able to detect things at a very fine level. And it's the, th the thought was being that we would need to be able to detect very well camouflaged snakes to avoid risk of these dangerous encounters. But even if this is the case, we know it's not foolproof because millions of people still suffer from snake bites every single year all around the world. And the consequences of those bites can be devastating. We've seen death. We've seen disability. We've seen disfigurement. We've seen deprivation. We've seen destitution from snake bite. Every day, it's a sadness that never goes away. Your child buried next to your home. Yet another young life taken during the night. And the sister left behind met her fate from the very same cobra that slithered into their bed. Her hand now severely deformed. She is blind, she cannot walk, she will never marry. An innocent victim without the chance of a productive life. So how do venomous snakes cause such devastating impact on people? Well, they have this adaptation in their mouths, specifically in the upper jaws. They have venom glands, one on either side of the head. And this venom gland is where the venom is produced, this mixture of toxic uh, chemicals that can be used to usually uh, subdue a prey item, but occasionally, when snakes bite defensively, impact upon people. And when the snake bites, a muscle found around the back of these venom glands contracts and it squeezes the gland, forcing the venom down some ducts into the top of some modified teeth that we refer to as fangs. And this enables snakes to inject a large amount of highly toxic venom very, very quickly. Ready? Yeah. Well, there we go. Good. That was slightly different. Yeah. So you can see these snakes, they bite rapidly. People are unable to avoid a bite. And yet a large bolus of venom comes out that can cause really devastating harm. And ultimately, people are suffering from the consequences of this every day. Whether it be lifelong disability or mental trauma or, in the case of many, death. We think that upwards of 138,000 people die from snake bite every single year. That's one person every four minutes. So two people, on average, will have died from snake bite since I started this talk. And it's predominantly people who are living in places like sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia who are greatest at risk. Rural, impoverished people of the tropics. And usually, these will be people like farmers or herders working in agricultural areas like this, where there are lots of snakes present in the same environment as the people. But it's not just during the day. Snakes are at risk when these people are walking home at dusk and at night without a torch or appropriate footwear, or also in their houses at night, where there are no barriers for snakes to come in. So people are at risk of snake bite for 24 hours a day in these environments. So what can we do about this? Well, recently, the World Health Organization announced that it was going to treat snake bite as a priority neglected tropical disease. This means that they're garnering the global health community to try and address this problem. And we, at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, along with partners at many different places all over the world, are performing scientific research so that we can try and save the lives and limbs of snake bite victims. This includes studying venom, understanding what the toxins do, how they cause harm, and how we can develop new medicines that can better tackle snake bite. But it also, most importantly, involves working in the very communities that are affected by snake bite. 
trialling the use of interventions, in this case, a motorcycle. In Kenya and Nigeria, we're using motorbikes as ambulances to try and rapidly transport these rural, isolated snake bite victims to hospital much quicker than they can do so already, to see if that improves their chances of avoiding lifelong disability or lethality. But we also need to make sure we're educating these people about the risk of snake bite. What can they be doing to try and modify their behaviour so that they can avoid bites? But also, what should they do if they or someone they know is bitten by a venomous snake? It's only through a coordinated approach that we can really begin to tackle the world's snake bite burden. And the final thing I'll say about this challenge is that we shouldn't demonise the snakes. These animals are biting people defensively because they feel threatened. But they actually play a really important role in the uh, ecosystems uh, where people are being bitten. So, for example, venomous snakes are controlling the rodent population, which would otherwise decimate the very crops that these agricultural workers are growing. And for pu purely selfish reasons, their venoms are really fascinating for the development of new medicines for other disease problems. Medicines have been developed from snake venom already to treat high blood pressure and bleeding disturbances. And we can't ignore the fact that snakes have been influentially linked to people for millions of years, whether it be potentially influencing the way we see the world through to their roles in cultures and religious texts. And ultimately, we need to focus our attention on mitigating human-snake conflict rather than demonising these creatures that are both feared and revered throughout the world. Thank you.